Good evening, everybody, and welcome to Skeptics in the Pub Online. For the first timers here, welcome. Um, what are we all about? Well, I think uh, the Human League said it best when they said, we'll always be together, however far it seems. We'll always be together, together in electric dreams. Except instead of electric dreams, we've got the best skeptics groups from the UK and across Europe. And we are coming together on a weekly basis every Thursday night at seven o'clock to bring you very real uh, snippets of science, reason and critical thinking here in Twitch. You can support us in many ways, uh, of course. Cold Hard Cash is a, my personal favourite, and there'll be links in the Twitch chat uh, if you want to make a donation. But otherwise, just follow us on the social medias, say nice things about us, inflate our egos to the best of your abilities. Thank you very much. Um, the format for tonight's talk, um, same as always, we'll introduce our speaker in a moment. He's going to talk for around right about 45-ish minutes. Then we get a break. After the break, you get a chance to ask your own questions. Um, there is a link again that will be going into the chat and Twitch for you to put your questions in. And even if you don't have a question, you can upvote other people's questions. So remember to be nice and polite if you're commenting in the Twitch chat. I should also mention that closed captions are available, although our speaker tonight is much better spoken than I am. You can also join us in our Zoom pub, the Lock in Razor, after tonight's talk. But Without further ado, let's get on to tonight's speaker. So, our speaker this evening is baby scientist Dr. Caspar Adiman. Now, he should be appearing on screen next to me right now. Please temper your disappointment that it's not a baby in a lab coat. That would have been amazing. He's a scientist that studies babies. Dr. Caspar Adiman is a lecturer in psychology and director of the Infant Lab at Goldsmith University of London. He's investigated how babies acquire language, concepts, and even a sense of time. His Baby Laughter Project has surveyed families all over the world to find out just what causes those little giggles. And he's interested in how laughter helps babies bond and learn. He also worked with Grammy winner Imogen Heap to create a song scientifically designed to make babies happy. His popular science book, The Laughing Baby, was published in April last year and is available at all good bookshops, some mediocre ones, and even the bad one as well. So without further ado, Casper, the floor is yours. Everybody, please give out Casper a big round of applause, virtual applause on Twitch. Over to you, Casper. Right, well, thank you so much. And yeah, although we are virtual pub, I have got my drink here. I'm ready to go. Um, and it's great to be at a skeptics event. I, I've been supporting them for, for decades now, I think. And this is going to be a talk of two halves. It's going to be um, some murderous philosophers and some laughing babies. Um, and what we might learn from both of them. Uh, a quick quiz to go into the into the chat there. Who are those two philosophers? Um, see if you know. Uh, I can't see the chat, unfortunately, so I can't tell you if you're right or wrong. Um, but, yeah, another way of phrasing this this particular talk is to to sort of see who actually knows more about the meaning of life. Is it the philosophers or is it the babies? And given that introduction you've heard, I might be a little bit biased um, in my own uh, expectation of the answer um, and, and in what you might be about to hear. Um, but let's um, start with life, the universe and everything. If you're a a good nerd like me, then one of your formative memories is uh, this uh, sequence of books. And um, yeah, it was truly one of my favorite books ever. Um, and so um, like any Douglas Adams fan, I was in an interest, I sort of had the obvious thing to do when I was in an interesting position that I was handed the names and addresses of every single philosopher in the British Isles. Um, so I had that for some boring uh, marketing purposes, but once we'd done that, it's like, what else could I do with the list of every single philosopher? Um, so naturally enough, I decided to uh, write them a letter. Um, and this was way back in 2003. Uh, you won't need to read the whole of the letter. I'll just sort of get you through the really important bits, which is that I have it in my head that you might know the meaning of life, the universe and everything. Therefore, I'm writing to ask if you could explain it all to me. Do not be too flattered. I'm writing to every philosopher in the country. Um, so that was what I wrote. I wrote a little bit more help as well. 
Um, and I wrote that, sent that to 644 philosophers. Um, I sent that as a real letter, signed them individually, put them all in envelopes. It cost me uh, like 150 pounds in postage. Um, probably cost about four times that amount these days. Um, and um, then I waited. And I've now been waiting like 18 years. So I don't think I'm going to get any more responses. Um, just in the chat again, perhaps you can have your guess as to how many of those 644 replied. Uh, and again, I'm sorry I can't, I can't see the chat to see who's got closest to this. Um, and, uh, you know, minus points for anybody who did say 42. Um, that would be too obvious. Actually, 22 philosophers replied um, to this letter. Um, and in their replies, I gave them a little bit of guidance as to what they might want to, to say. So in my letter, I said that if God were required to explain himself, I'm sure she could do so in a few eloquent paragraphs in one crisply typeset full scat sheet. sheet. Um, as an atheist, I have not tried asking God. Um, and, you know, as a philosopher, um, you're certainly welcome to, to drone on a little bit longer than just a single page. Um, so that was my challenge to 644 philosophers. 22 of them uh, took up that challenge. Um, and I think it's worth sort of not going through every single answer, but let's classify the types of answers. So they could be about life. They might be about the universe. Um, uh, some of them probably will be um, taking on God as, as, as the answer. Um, and then um, everything else maybe will have some of those. Um, so send this out in October 2003. Just four days later, I got my first response uh, from Mark Nelson of Westman College. Um, and he said that a good account of the meaning of life, the universe and everything, could not be contained in one crisply typeset full scap sheet. And I think it would end up looking a bit religious. Um, so he suggested two whole books, um, fairly short books, um, that I should read. Uh, I, I didn't read those because, uh, as he said, they were they were the God's answer. And I wasn't so interested in that. Um, the next answer came from uh, Andrew McGonagall, a nice um, short answer, again, recommending a couple of books. Lots of reasons why life is valuable, worth living. Um, but there isn't very informative way of collecting them under a single heading. Um, but if you're interested, Thomas Nagel has two short essays, The Meaning of Life and the absurd. Um, and I, yeah, I do recommend both of those. Um, they are very Thomas Nagel essays that they just probably end you, leave you ending up a bit more confused than you started with. Um, so I think that's um, an everything um, answer, that one. Um, the next answer was uh, encouraging. So the meaning of life, that's every philosopher's nightmare question, especially over dinner. But uh, my answer, drawing on Canton Aristotle, Meaning of life consists of activity in accordance with reason. Do things with our lives, be active and not fritter it away. And we should um, do it in line with what makes us human. So be rational and um, actually communicate um, as if other people are the same. Um, so that's quite a, a, a concise answer there. I've well done to uh, Dr. T uh, Timmerman. Uh, the next answer was actually even more concise than that um, and a little disturbing. So Andrew Belsey from Cardiff University said, uh, Dear Mr. Adiman, the meaning of life is preparation for death. I hope that you are well prepared. Now, um, it's very short and it's not that sweet. In fact, I you know, read in a certain tone of voice that could almost um, be a death threat. Um, although, you know, I've been on my guard since October 2003 and Andrew Belsey hasn't caught me out yet. So if it is a death threat, uh, he hasn't been uh, felt the need to follow through on it. It's probably just, you know, a theoretical death threat. They're, that's philosophers for you. Uh, but, yeah, I'm making progress. I'm, I'm making the philosophers angry enough uh, to issue death threats. We must be on the right lines. Um, the next answer is probably my favourite and probably my best guidance for what makes a good philosopher. 
getting I won't read the whole of this answer, but by the end of this, I felt like Michael Rush was the sort of guy that you would want to go to the pub with. Um, and, um, you know, I think that makes him quite a good philosopher. Um, but, you know, he first started out was wondering if I was trying to um, collectively humiliate all philosophers in the country. No, not at all. Um, not even now at this late stage. Um, and then he sort of pointed out, well, actually, and several people did point it to suggest this, that this is a pseudo philosophical question asked by non philosophers. Any philosopher aren't claiming to have an answer for you is cheeky, misguided or possibly both. Um, now, I still really don't understand quite um, what, um, why this isn't a philosophical question. Um, I tried my best to figure that out. Um, I think it's something to do with the definition of meaning um, and whether that can itself be applied to life. Um, but despite having done all of that, he did in the very last paragraph here, um, you'll say that, well, um, maybe there's a purpose to life. Um, and his best suggestion was um, the um, excellent philosophy of uh, uh, Theodore S. Logan and Ted S. Preston, be excellent to each other. Although he, as a philosopher, thought perhaps we ought to translate this into Greek and uh, find some way to attribute it to Aristotle. Um, but that's you know, a very good answer. Be excellent to each other. Very short and pithy. Um, the next answer was the very first one I had about uh, the universe. Um, so this is from Derek Parfit, who's um, uh, one of Britain's most revered philosophers at the time. He's since passed away. Uh, and he referred me to this wonderful essay of his, um, called Why Anything, Why This? Which not just considered um, why does the universe exist or why does this particular universe exist? It considered why should there be any universes? What possible universes could there be? Um, so it sort of went way beyond my simple question about life, the universe, um, and considered a universe of universes. So respect you, Derek Parfit. Um, and it's surprisingly accessible essay as well. Very easy to read. One of these philosophers that produces complex concepts, but in, in, in clear language. Um, I didn't get it completely right. So Max Stewart was... Uh, uh, dear, dear Casper, I'm an economist, not a philosopher. Um, but he still gave me his answer, which was, was very nice. And I, I think I wrote back to him. We ended up having quite a little chat about his answers of the, um, the meaning of life. Um, but yes, he, he uh, um, uh, shouldn't really be on my list, perhaps. So maybe it's only 21. Um, but also at the London School of Economics, Dame Nancy Cartwright, um, one of the... Um, most eminent philosophers in the country. She studies the philosophy of quantum mechanics, um, the philosophical foundations of whether um, sort of proper Boolean logic can be applied to the, um, the laws of a quantum universe. Um, surely if anybody could answer this question, um, it would be her. Sadly not. Uh, she was refreshingly honest, though, in her answer, um, that no... Uh, she didn't have a, a, a clue how to answer that that question. Um, so within you know, um, a few short weeks and very great thanks to all these philosophers who um, you know, did bother, however short their responses, to, to try and give me um, an answer to the life, the universe and everything. None of them really were very satisfying, I'm, I'm sad to say. Um, but let's just recap what we, we did get. So I think I got um, 10 answers that were about what is the meaning of life and whether that is a, is a real question and um, how you should act in the world. Um, I got two answers that were about the nature of the universe and what that might tell us. Uh, I got um, six answers that were hard to classify or said that the question wasn't meaningful. Um, three answers saying that... Um, God who did it, and then this one single solitary um, death threat, um, which is not bad, bad odds. I was expecting perhaps a few more um, people um, blaming it on God or sort of excusing themselves having to give the answer and saying that um, God would give you the answer instead. Um, 
And yeah, I didn't understand all of the answers, especially some of the more uh, technical in-depth ones. Um, but I did appreciate uh, everybody who did try and do it. And a lot of those answers were shorter um, than one crisply typeset full scap sheet. Um, so if you want to read the full answers, I've gathered them together um, to, to pad out a novel I was writing. Um, and uh, that's completely free online. So if you go to that website, um, you can download the ebook version um, and sort of see the, the full answers uh, in, their, uh, in their entirety. And I have a go at my own answer in there as well, which um, wasn't so good. Um, and, and that might be where we leave it. But actually, um, once my curiosity was piqued about this, I think I might have found, um, at least not maybe the ultimate answer, but certainly my ultimate answer. So that was in February 2015 when I came across um, this essay online, Quant Cosmic Evolution and the Meaning of Life um, by John Messley. Uh, you see that in Humanity Plus there. So this is in one of the um, uh, transhumanist um, publications. And... Um, you can also find this on John's website, Reasoning and Meaning. Um, and it really is um, trying to give a cosmic answer to this question. So are there trends in, evolu in evolution, cosmic, biological and cultural, that support the claim that life is meaningful, is becoming meaningful or is becoming increasingly meaningful? So he's really trying to look at the whole span of life over the evolutionary time scales and to see if, well, is the meaning at, um, at this point as we're you know, intelligent, rational humans? Um, and is that more than there was when there were no humans, when there was no rational beings, no conscious beings? Um, and sort of argues that possibly there is. Um, and that being a transhumanist, he thinks that, well, maybe in the future there'll be even cleverer beings. And that that's kind of the key part of his answer that, um, even if we don't have the answer right now, um, it's possible that we're, we're moving towards being able to answer that question. And so what's important for us right where we stand at the moment is to make that possible, to make the future better than the past in any way, shape or form. And that can be our contribution um, to being meaningful. Um, and that's probably what he says there. He says it a bit more succinctly. Um, and um, this is a great answer because it is about your individual life. It's also about the vast sweep of uh, cosmic time and evolutionary time. Um, it's not avoiding the question. Um, and it is confronting death. It's not on just a human time scale. He's really thinking millennia, millions of years beyond our time, which... I think was the very first answer I got that actually did that and that did um, just look up a bit from the horizon and look around at the universe um, and say that, you know, just get a bit beyond your own little tiny preoccupations. That If you want an answer about the meaning of life, the universe and everything, you need to be thinking on a universal timescale. You need to be thinking about, um, the distant past and the far future. Um, so it's a, it's a wonderful essay. Um, and certainly, you know, it's provided me with the, the answer I was, I was looking for. So I was very happy when I got that. I was even more happy when I noticed that this essay is actually pretty short. And in fact, if I, uh, I downloaded it and I uh, retypeset it and uh, made the font quite small, um, but I could actually fit it onto one A4 side of sheet of paper. I haven't been able to get hold of full scap. Uh, um, but I put John's essay onto a single sheet of paper. I have that now pinned uh, in, a, in a frame up on the wall of my office um, at Goldsmiths. Um, and, you know, I would uh, recommend it to you as a good starting point for sort of an answer to the meaning of life. Um, but... You, know, you should be making your own answers too. Um, and yeah, if we had to um, summarise John's uh, point of view a bit, bit more succinctly than that, I would say uh, it's 
try and leave the world uh, better than you find it, or perhaps um, be excellent to everything. Um, which, you know, I think it would be hard to disagree with that. Um, but, yeah, what is your answer? Um, I would be interested. So we do have a um, one of the uh, question and answer links is for you to suggest a short answer of your own. Um, just to set the challenge for you, I asked this in uh, Goldsmiths. I gave a version of this talk and we put up this sign in the library um, and you'll see that we challenge students to do it on just a single post-it note. Um, and uh, they weren't shy in trying to answer the question. Uh, quite a few of them uh, did suggest maybe it's 42 um, or some other you know, number. Um, and you know, they're not always uh, accepting the received wisdom on that. Um, there were a few who said, uh, you know, it's God, uh, the universal projection of a hyperdimensional object known as God, accepting Jesus Christ as, as your Lord and Savior. Pray to Allah and you're good, mate. I mean, I think, you know, it is a nice answer. If you happen to believe in God, um, the meaning of the universe is taken care of, uh, all wrapped up in a nice, neat bow. Um, you're good, mate, basically. Um, but the Goldsmith students discovered a whole new category, um, not considered by my philosophers, not considered uh, by me or John Messley. Um, and that is uh, food was quite a common uh, answer to uh, life, the universe and everything among uh, Goldsmith students. And in particular, Morley's fried chicken. So any of you in South London, um, that seemed to be quite a popular uh, answer to the, the question of, uh, of the meaning of life. Um, maybe you should check it out. Um, Goldsmiths, as you may or may not know, is an art college or famous for uh, former alumni like Vivian Westwood and uh, Damien Hurst. Um, and here you have maybe the future Damien Hursts of uh, uh, these things. Maybe one of these... Uh, <laughs> Post-it notes will be worth a bit of money on one, one day soon. Um, we actually, because we did this in the library, the librarians insisted on archiving all of these post-it notes. So these are now stored for posterity uh, in some uh, archive folder in, in the permanent collection of Goldsmith's art library. Um, and amongst those, they, we did have a few um, more outlandish answers. I don't know what it was about our question, but it made some people sick. And then we did get a good John Messley answer, actually, the people trying to improve um, uh, everything. So um, this appeared on our notice board. Attention maintenance, please fix the water fountain pressure. It's excruciatingly slow. You know, someone there who's trying to just improve the world for everyone. Um, and so that ends part one. Please do um, yeah, give me your suggestions for the... Um, the ultimate answer to life, the universe, and everything. Uh, do point me to any good essays that I might not have spotted as well. Um, but now let's move on um, to my own specialist subject, uh, which is um, babies, and see what they can tell us about life and what it means to be alive. Um, and in particular, um, you know, one of my things I study is um, why babies enjoy being babies. And you see here is Cosmo just um, uh, six weeks old and still already having a wonderful time in the world. Um, so we'll just whiz through that, just to work out what is the point of being babies. It's not quite as obvious as you might imagine. Um, some of the things that we owe um, to babies and um, what it is we can learn about life um, from babies. And then we'll get um, to our questions and hopefully even answers. Um, so, um, yeah, if we sort of think about what it is we owe to babies, um, I think we could perhaps here classify there be six surprising superpowers that we gained directly because we were babies. Um, and the first of those, um, and perhaps, you know, the obvious one is that we get a really good start in life. And this is 
something unique to human babies. But let's just, um, in case you haven't seen a baby for a while, I'll just sort of whiz you through those first few years. So at the very beginning, babies are surprisingly useless. Um, they spend the first three months mostly asleep. They can barely roll over or sit up. Um, they're very uncoordinated. Um, and they don't really do very much in that early period. Um, yet, within a short period of time, uh, by the end of one year... Uh, what are you doing? Now we're quite purposeful. We've got pincer grip. We can uh, interact with the world. This baby's got a, some goal. Some experimenting almost with the, with the world and interacting with, uh, with mummy there as, as they do this. Um, and, yeah, undoubtedly this, this baby is, uh, yeah, more interested in uh, discovering something about throwing little fish on the floor um, than actually eating them. And so we really are, you know, an active explorer in the world. This baby is uh, trying by a process of trial and error to discover things. So much so that by two years old, they think they've kind of mastered it. And obviously, a big part of that magic is being able to talk. Let me just skip forward to. Uh, here we go. having a you know a full conversation with daddy so in in two short years you know they have learned uh, how to interact with people interact with the physical world they've learned the beginnings of the names and language of all sorts of things in many ways i like to see the first two years as like a training montage um as a superhero in the movies when they discover their powers for the first time they start experimenting with them and that first two years of our lives are is our um training montage for all of the superpowers that we have um as as humans and it's really worth stopping to think that that's um an unusual we go about it in an unusual way so this is a uh, baby giraffe who's just um half an hour old and um, you know, within that time, oh no, not quite, nearly, yeah, within half an hour, they're up on their feet, not completely stable, um, but already wandering around. And that is a, a worthwhile thing to think about in comparison to baby humans, because Giraffes and humans, we all grew up in a very similar sort of evolutionary environment. Here, this is the African savanna where um, giraffes uh, live and where um, for the vast majority of our evolutionary history, um, our species evolved and um, appeared. Um, and we've taken a very different approach to um, coping with that. So giraffes became this very specialist uh, um, uh, herbivore. Um, they are able to do sort of a lot of the basic giraffes things from within moments of birth. Yet humans um, are completely helpless at birth and they arrive not being able to do anything. 
Um, but where they arrive and what happens is a very different situation. So they arrive um, into a tribe. So these are the Hazda people um, of uh, um, rural Gambia. Uh, they are hunter-gatherers. They obviously are not um, are, um, evolutionary... Um, uh, they're, they're not from our evolutionary past, but their lifestyle is probably not so different from a lifestyle all of our ancestors would have had 50,000, 60,000 years ago. Um, they forage um, in uh, sort of savanna land and um, maintain sort of uh, a, a sort of a, a tribal village size of um, 50 to 150 sort of uh, people, including the babies. And within that, looking after the babies is one of the big challenges um, that they face. Um, and this seems to have been... Uh, a really central part of what it is that makes us human and that what makes us a success as human is this was part of the lifestyle that we chose and that um, babies were like a keystone within that. Um, so as you um, might have already encountered, um, the evolutionary psychologist Robin Dunbar identified that um, part of the explosion of our uh, the size of our brain was due to the explosion in the size of our social groups. And so as our social groups got bigger and bigger, um, the number of connections between individuals um, increases much faster than the number of individuals. So you don't just have to keep track of um, uh, Bill, Ted, and, uh, and John. You now have to keep track of um, what Bill thinks of Ted, what Ted thinks of Bill, what Bill and Ted both think of John and Emily and Claire. Um, and so to be able to survive in a social group, um, you need a brain that that's getting bigger. Um, and so this, this was one consequence, um, of this, this choice of lifestyle. Um, and so we're going to need a bigger brain. And, um, so, um, we need a bigger brain to keep track of all of this. Once we get there, actually, what something interesting happens that um, what used to be a, a, a social mechanism in other primates to groom each other gets replaced with um, uh, laughter and language as a way of um, interacting and keeping the, that social group cohesive. And the big kicker is that you can't give birth to a baby with a, a giant brain. Um, the pelvis is of a limited size. A giant brain will not fit through that. So we have to give birth to helpless babies um, and then grow the brain outside the womb. Um, so this is part of why babies are born so completely helpless uh, and part of the success of what lets us have a big brain. Um, but this comes with its own interesting side effect, um, which was discovered and sort of modelled out by... Um, Steve Piandotzi and Celeste Kidd, um, and it goes a bit like this, that if, um, if we're going to look after this helpless baby, um, you need uh, a good parent. So they're going to have to have a big brain. Um, and if you want a bigger brain, then you're going to have to give birth to a more helpless baby um, so that it can grow its brain uh, bigger and bigger. But if your baby is more helpless, then you're going to have to be a better parent and this actually leads to a positive feedback loop that um, the fact that the mere fact that we have helpless babies uh, leads us to um, another positive selection pressure for bigger brains. So babies are really our key part of uh, the sort of success story of us being a big brain species. Paradoxically, uh, being a baby is also one of the main reasons why we live so long. Um, so this was discovered by uh, anthropologist Kristen Hawkes. It's something called the, the grandmother hypothesis. So she observed the Hazda, the tribe, and watched what the grandmothers did in those tribes. And um, a, another hunter-gatherer tribe in southern Africa called the Kung, and discovered that the grandmothers um, did very different things. In one tribe, they stayed in the village um, 
doing uh, sort of uh, babysitting, looking after the youngest children. Um, that was in the Kong, in this lower group. In the other group, they would actually go out foraging with the mothers and the, the babies would be carried um, with that group. Um, and um, yet, in all cases, they were doing something that was for the good of their children's children. Um, and so, um, and this primarily is uh, maternal grandmothers. So um, maternal grandmothers are investing in their daughter's children, daughter's offspring. Um, and when they do that, um, obviously, um, the longer that they can live, the more grandchildren um, they can care for. And if you are long lived and can care for more grandchildren, you increase their chances of survival. So you increase the chances of passing on your own genes through your children and your children's children, um, including those uh, for longevity. Um, so there's another uh, feedback loop, um, this time on um, selection for getting uh, older and older, uh, living longer and longer, living past uh, menopause. Um, and again, all to do with the need to invest in our seemingly helpless offspring. Um, but it's interesting as to why we are helpless at all. Um, and the answer here is again to do with um, a trade off and a choice that to be the generous, to be able to cope with anything that life throws at you, um, you don't want to hard code things in genetically, like an, a giraffe that learns to walk and learns a few basic skills. You want a um, you want to be able to learn to adapt to whatever your environment. Um, and that if you have a big brain that, that uh, works like that, you have to teach yourself. Um, so we saw that with a little baby throwing things off their high chair um, to discover uh, things about the, the universe. Um, and this is something that all babies do in part of their process of discovery. All of that play is all about trial and error. It's about discovering things. And so the, um, you know, I'm a baby scientist. I often uh, jokingly say that babies are little scientists. Um, but uh, the American baby scientist, Alison Gopnik, she actually goes a little bit further and she says, no, that's that's back to front. Really, it was that curiosity in childhood that came first. Uh, it was the needing to experiment and discover the universe um, that was a key part of our generalist big brained approach to the world. Um, and so it's not that children are little scientists, but that science and sort of that um, inquiring sort of skeptical attitude to the to the universe um, grows out of a brain that doesn't take other people's arms word uh, answer on face value, but actually discovers things um, by a suck it and see approach. Um, and actually, um, now, if you really wanted to go into life, the universe and everything, um, this actually fits quite nicely um, with uh, one of the most bewildering and uh, um, possibly true theories out there, um, known as the free energy principle by Carl Friston. There it all is in uh, all its hideous mathematical glory, um, which tries actually to be a theory of everything. And... Uh, it's, it's hard to know whether it succeeds. Carl Friston is undoubtedly one of the cleverest people alive today, um, but it, he has a, a terrible inability to be able to explain himself um, and explain perhaps you know, the nature of these equations um, very clearly. Um, but in a nutshell, um, he's trying to give an account of the whole purpose of life uh, on this planet uh, and what the goal of a living being is, which is to sort of stay alive. Um, and a key uh, message of that is to try and be less surprised over time, which I think I think Douglas Adams would would quite like that as a um, as a sort of the, the meaning of life. Um, and it certainly fits with um, babies' constant curiosity about the world. So there's a couple more, and uh, we're nearly done. So the last. Um, sort of perhaps surprising thing uh, that we get from babies is art. Uh, so anthropologist Alan Disenyanki um, started looking at what is the origin of art. And 
Um, a lot of people would think that it's these um, people singing around a campfire after a hunt um, to celebrate sort of the collective action of a group um, or sort of drawing up that hunt on the wall of a cave again to sort of to share that with the other members of the group. And that is certainly a an early part of art, but Ernest Yankee wants to go a little bit further back than that and say, well, what, what's really going on in all of those things is bringing people closer together, getting them to have a shared sense of the same feeling. Um, it's about um, uh, a collective communion in something. Um, and it's a collective communion in, a, in an emotion. So you're trying to evoke an emotion in somebody else when you're creating art of some kind. And that actually, if you really want to look deep into the mists of time for where that come from, then it comes from a mother singing gently to her baby to calm it down or playing games with it to, uh, to make it excited. Um, so then this Yankee sort of describes it thus, that all over the world we've developed these nodes of cultures that we call ceremonies and rituals, which do for their mother members what mothers naturally do for their babies, engage their interests, involve them in a shared rhythmic pulse, and instill feelings of closeness and communion. Um, so the very first art form is not a man coming back from the hunt, pr proud of having killed something or another and s howling to various friends. It's actually the mother reassuring that little scared child um, or sort of just, you know, letting their um, share in a sort of a, a common emotion. And here's just a, a little quick example to give you a feeling of how that probably might be true. Um, yeah, so I th I certainly think Ellen Disson Yankees on to something there. Um, so let's just recap: the babies are central to our um, having a big brain. They're sort of um, part of the solution to our generalist um, uh, will cope with whatever situation you throw at us. Um, approach to survival and evolution um, they are also behind our long lives and our scientific curiosity um, and the essence of art comes from how we had to communicate with these little um, uh, languageless beings um, but in the, the meaning of life perhaps the biggest lesson that we can learn from babies is to do with happiness um, and that's my own area of research, sort of what makes babies happy? Why do they enjoy being ba happy? And that's something that, like ten, five years into working with babies, it suddenly hit me. God, yeah, babies are happier um, than you and I. And they, happiness is a really central part of what it is to be a baby, uh, how we interact with them um, and sort of how they interact with the world. And and maybe it's it's important so for the last eight or nine years i've been looking into that um and i think i have um you know um found that it really is a central part of the story so um one thing we discovered quite to my surprise is that um, babies almost always wake up happy uh, so we did surveys of babies in brazil and england and when they went to sleep for the next um, next morning for 10 days parents would keep a diary um, and almost uh, 80, 80 plus percent of the time babies would wake up um, eight nine or ten out of ten happiness um, which yeah certainly I never do 
Um, babies have um, a very sort of uh, built-in advantage in terms of happiness in that one of the secrets when you look at um, adult literature on, on happiness is that it's um, really quite central to it is the quality of your relationships. And that if we look at sort of um, this sort of idealized relationship of, a, of the unconditional love between parents and their baby and their baby and their parents, um, we'll see that that brings happiness in both directions. Um, and uh, this is something that, you know, <laughs> therapists make, a, make a, <laughs> a whole living trying to recapture perhaps sort of uh, those happiest moments before it all goes wrong. But on a simpler level, just improving the quality of your relationships, making them more genuine, making them more direct, um, which is something that obviously comes so naturally to a baby, um, will improve your own happiness. Um, babies also have an inside track on um, the, the secret of happiness found by Mihal Csikszentmihalyi, who um, went around investigating happiness in all walks of life, um, found people who were just the happiest dentist, the happiest postman, the happiest death row prisoner, um, and discovered that all of them were able to get very absorbed in the day-to-day -day, uh, intricacies of their life. Um, they would be very keen on always on trying to be a better postman, um, be a better death row prisoner, be um, a better um, dentist. And um, you sort of describe this as, um, especially when you get lost in that um, focus on that immediate moment, as being in a state of flow. Um, and it's all to do with constantly challenging yourself to the limit of your current abilities, but not beyond that. If you go beyond your, your limits, it's, it, you may set down to anxiety. If you're below your state of, of a skill, you're in a state of boredom. So you've got to always maintain um, sort of learning something new. And again, if you look to what, what babies do every single day of their life, that's exactly what's going on. Every day is a new challenge, and it's a challenge that within a few days they will master and move on to the next one. So a lot of their happiness um, is a sort of a genuine sort of case study of what Michal Shikmahali would say is the best possible happiness. And then I also like to, like to say that... Um, uh, babies can teach you a lot when you compare to what meditation is all about. So meditation and mindfulness is everywhere these days. Um, and the main goal of meditation, mindfulness, um, all of these things is to be in the present moment. Uh, so going a little bit beyond what uh, 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 Michal Chisak Mahali would say, it really is to sort of let go of the uh, the thoughts of the past, let go of the thoughts of the, the future, just abide in the present moment. Um, and obviously that's incredibly hard to do. Uh, but if you do manage to that, do that, you capture sort of a deep tranquility, a deep, a deep um, contentedness in life. Um, the little babies are already like Zen masters at that ability um, to enjoy the present moment. everything thank you you can you can read a bit more about uh uh all of the things that we owe to babies in in this book uh there it is um and uh, yeah i hope you'll have lots of questions for me in the the second half 
Um, thanks to all of the babies and parents and fellow researchers who've been involved in that. Um, and yeah, thank you for uh, listening to that first part. Oh, and I do want to hear your answers to life, the universe and everything. Thank you. Casper, thank you so much. Yes, everybody. So before we head off to the break, quick reminder, we've got two Slido links and you'll get them both in the Twitch text chat. One of them is just for general Q&A. We'll get to that. But uh, the separate one from them is where you enter in your meaning of life. So please put your questions in one of them and your meaning of meanings of life in the other one. Just before we head to the break, a reminder, next week we've got the awesome Dr. Lindsay Osterman. You might know her from the Serious Inquiries Only podcast, along with Thomas Smith. Uh, her talk is on how the evolutionary psychologist got his hypothesis and other just-so stories, sense and nonsense in evolutionary psychology. So again, something to look forward to next Thursday night. So we're going to take a break now, folks. Uh, we're going to be back at uh, 10 past 8. So you've got plenty of time to feed and water yourselves in the meantime. Get your questions in. Upvote as well. Uh, and we will see you then. In the meantime, can we please have some virtual applause in the Twitch chat for Dr. Casper Ironman? See you after the break. Okay, so we are back. Welcome back from the break, folks. Uh, we are joined once again by Dr. Casper Adaman. Before we get into your questions, we are going to examine your opinions on the meaning of life. So, Casper, welcome back. Let's get stuck straight in. Um, I think we'll go from the top of the list downwards as far as we as far as we feel free to go. Is that okay with you? Yeah, let's see the, the, the answers. Yeah. Okay, great. All right, so... <laughs> Mo uh, top of the list is from our very own sceptical Gumby. Uh, uh, if it wasn't for the existence of tea, ukuleles and hot sauce, life would be bleak and meaningless. But as these things exist, everything's gravy. That covers it pretty well, right? <laughs> How you combine those three, I, I'm trying to imagine. Uh... Yeah. I mean, I, I would I would upgrade the ukes to a guitar, but, um, you know, mm -hmm. and maybe mm -hmm. the tea to coffee, but each to their own, I guess. Yeah. Okay, Cleo uh, is next, giving me the feels in front of camera is bad, Cleo, they, that there were people whose life was better because you existed. Casper, that's a very altruistic uh, response we've got from Cleo there. What's your yeah, thoughts? Yeah, if hell is other people, and yeah, maybe heaven is other people as well, and it's like, yeah, you... Um, if you make a positive impact, that's uh, it's hard to deny that, isn't it? I, I suppose so. I, it, it, it's a nice ethos in many ways yeah. to try and um, put in more than you get out. Um, I mean, okay. I think that's what but that's what parents are doing, I suppose. In uh, uh, the, the, way, the good it? ones, <laughs> the good ones, anyway. Right? Uh, not not my wife who very nastily took my daughter right up to bed just as we were about to come back on camera there, which would have been great. Um, so yeah. she's ruined a, a special moment there. Thanks for that one, Laura. Okay, Garnet uh, says, there's no meaning to life, so just get on and enjoy yours without having a negative effect upon anyone else's, at the very least, uh, or positive if you're able. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, I mean, it's... Um it's fairly neutral. I think I, I feel like you could do you could do better than that. But uh, yeah, maybe he takes on board and is a philosopher and sort of can prove. Uh, as I say, I never worked out exactly why they claim categorically that the meaning of life is, is um, an unphilosophical question. But quite a few of them would say that. So maybe Garnet is a philosopher. But, well, uh, I, yeah, I know Garnet well enough. I, I would agree with you on that one. But uh, I mean, I guess it does. It, it does open up the point where you know, I, I guess for for many, life does not necessarily have to have a meaning, or you mm -hmm. can make your own meaning from it, right? Yeah, and, and yeah, I think it's it's a challenge for atheists, isn't it? That if you if you don't have God providing these external things, then we really we don't we don't accept that there is any sort of absolute truths of any kind and in in that you know in that sense there's no real meaning so yeah i uh 
I'd concur with that. But yes, it, it does leave you a bit cast adrift when, <laughs> once you're you're facing that you know, dark, thankless universe. I, I, I guess some people are, have made peace with that, though they're quite happy with it. Yeah. Okay, the, the next one is um, not surprisingly anonymous. <laughs> uh, just try not to be too much of a cunt before you die. It's kind of the the Jim Jeffries equivalent of uh, <laughs> be excellent to each other, yeah. right? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, though, to the anonymous uh, input there for allowing me to yeah, you're not drop wrong. the C bomb. Anonymous, <laughs> you know, I, it, it is the first time I've uh, thrown up the C bomb on any of these talks. So uh, good stuff. About time. Okay, next one. Paul says, "Strive to get everything you want as soon as possible, then you can relax and coast to death." <laughs> mm -hmm. I guess the, the the point is where you know when you've got to the top the the. Um, so much of life, and this is psychologist, you have this um, achievement escalator. You can your dopamine levels will never be never need you to satisfy. And so the point in which you decide I can relax and start coasting to death, it's probably a good thing to do. But people lose sight of that, you know. And uh, and you've got Jeff Bezos needing another few billion dollars on top of the how many he already has. Okay, uh, one from uh, Monty Python. Be nice to people, avoid eating fat, read a good book occasionally, get some walking in, uh, try and live together in peace and harmony with everyone. Parrot, and that's paraphrased. Yeah, I don't remember that for, that sketch at all, do you? Uh, no, I, I don't. Must have, <laughs> must have uh, made it, not made it to the, the DVD cut, release. I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, I, I would say avoid eating too much fat. Uh, I mean, mm, like, yeah. A little bit of everything, right? Okay, maybe we'll take one more, right? Let's see. So this is from Andrew in Peterborough. Uh, I've learned that people will forget what you said. People will forget what you did. Uh, but people will never forget how you made them feel. So that's a quote from Maya Angelou. Yeah. Connecting with people, I mean, that's the secret of good relationships. And uh, that's part of the secret of happiness. So, yeah, that's a, a good... Let me just scroll through, see if there's any others that... Uh, I I like uh, only connect, Joe. That's another quote, isn't it? That's the E.M. Forster version of the the same thing. Uh, yeah, I'm 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 glad we got. How many have we got here? We've got more than twenty two, twenty seven. Yeah, uh, you're better than philosophers. Well done, uh, skeptics. Excellent. <laughs> Extra smug points with the skeptics. Great. <laughs> Okay, let's let's move across to the um, to the audience questions. Thank you for your input on that audience, and now we'll get to the questions. Uh, first one is from anonymous. Why does helping other people feature so highly amongst the answers to the meaning of life? Good segue, anonymous uh, question <laughs> there. Um, yeah. So, um, so in um, this is this is the, the absolute sort of central bit of um, Buddhism and a lot, lot of religious sort of answers to, to the meaning of life that um, you stop stop looking inwards and you try and look outwards. Um, and I think, you know, maybe it does link to, um, you know, the, the mean, you know, you shouldn't overlook the, the meaning that parents get from, from their children and that, yeah, is built into us by evolution that you um, you want to provide um, for your offspring, you want to provide for other people. So that's a very powerful drive, and I imagine that that you know reappears in um, this more general drive um, of right. You know, it's um, the things that actually does feel really rewarding to us um, is doing things for other people and. Yeah, you know, the the research sort of backs this up that one of the best things you can do for your own happiness is to start volunteering. Um, if you take on some volunteering role, um, you know the time you put into that gives you more in sort of satisfaction than you realise. For, for sure, there's definitely a there's definitely a dopamine hit there if you if you do a good deed, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, Next question from Anonymous, a difficult one. Um, do abused slash neglected slash deprived babies wake up happy? 
yeah, that's a very good question. And I'm sad to say that we don't have a, a good answer to it. Um, I guess there's, there are there are two parts to what we do know. So in, in those cases where children are extremely deprived, so like the Romanian orphans of the uh, early 90s, um, that can have consequences for your entire life. Um, but it doesn't always. So it, you can also, um, in a lot of situations where children have some early deprivation, they can really bounce back from it. And it's still something that researchers are looking into as to what what is it that makes resilience in somebody. Um, and it's obviously always hard to separate from uh, if you are abused and neglected, presumably um, there's often a genetic element that you've you've got a, a depressed, unhappy parent who's now um, providing a very depressive and unpleasant environment for a, for a baby. Um, and it's a, a, a double whammy. Um, there, actually, there, I do have a, there was a great, um, I do have a short talk about this when uh, they have done some studies where you can cross foster um, baby, uh, baby rats that have had either very neglectful parents or very uh, caring parents. And actually, as soon as they go into a caring or a, a neglectful home, that becomes their reality and that actually it's more nurture than uh, um, than genetics. Um, I'll, maybe I'll share the link of that uh, in the chat somewhere. Um, but, yeah, you know, actually, we haven't really done enough research. And, um, you know, in those situations where things are very difficult, um, it's probably not the re the academic researchers who are investigating it. It should be like, like frontline social services who are um, sort of uh, trying to improve things. I think so. I mean, you know, get, kids are resilient. I think we, we know that. Yeah. But obviously, there's there's a limit to everything, you know. And, and you know, a, a, as a parent, you know, you, you, you're sort of constantly sort of finding that balance between, you know, teaching your kids that the world can be cruel versus, you know, giving them a, a, a as carefree a, a childhood as possible, right? Yes, you, you can't, if you over it them, and that's not good for for their resilience in the future. You know, they, they have to build up some sort of contact with reality. Um, yeah. But, you yeah, know, quite, quite what, I mean, the other other thing, obviously, as a parent, you realise is there's no perfect answer to any of these things. You'll never you'll never get it exactly right, and don't try and uh, aim to do that. For sure. Okay, uh, let's move on. Next question is from Gray the Earthling. Um, welcome aboard, Earthling. How, if at all, does the behaviour of babies differ from the behaviour of drunk people? And let's stay away from the mm -hmm. obvious bowel and bladder movement issues. Let's mm -hmm. maybe talk about behaviour, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, uh, the, um, I don't know if yeah, drunk is a good, uh, uh, well, actually maybe it is a reasonable model of what it's like being younger. That um, Because what a lot of what you lose when you're drunk is these, these inhibitions and you're um, ability to sort of control what's what's happening to you, um, which I, I I'll give you actually my my preferred parallel is actually whenever I would go to Glastonbury on the first Thursday I would take acid and um, I would get completely uh, bewildered by everything that was happening around me and it felt to me like I was seven years old again and that the world was just that much more confusing and colourful and strange. Um, so, yeah, maybe my uh, <laughs> my uh, comparison is maps perhaps with uh, uh, with people on psychedelic drugs is a bit more like if, if you want to experience what it is to be a child again. <laughs> okay. I didn't want to stereotype you based on your funky T-shirt and cool hair, but <laughs> thank you for confirming everything that we all suspect. <laughs> like, no, it's, it's true. Like, like mm. looking at some of the footage you showed earlier on, like I am much more likely to want to splash in puddles after I've had a few cans rather than mm -hmm. normally, right? So, yeah. I, 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 you know, the, there is, I guess, 
Uh, not not necessarily being drunk, but sometimes it's sort of cathartic as an adult to be childlike, right? Yeah, I, th I think that maybe that is a good point that um, the opportunity um, to be childlike in the world uh, is something that we self censor as adults, and so yeah, we you know we don't get to stop and splash in the puddle, um, and because we're sort of so many things on it weighing us down. Um, and to stop and smell the flowers or splash in the puddles um, is more valuable than you th than you realise. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Okay, next question from Anonymous. Don't babies get more sad than adults as well as more happy? Their crying sounds so anguished. Uh, they are on a roller coaster, yeah. So they are... Um, yeah, you know, in a given day, they're bursting into laughter lots of times, but undoubtedly, they're yeah, um, they're crying a lot. And actually, quite a lot of the time, when I say to people I study baby laughter, I say, well, why don't you study what why they cry instead? And actually, a large proportion of psychology is studying why uh, um, why we're depressed, why we're unhappy, um, what's going wrong, and not so much studies the the opposite end, the flourishing. Um, what is success? What is happiness? Um, and given the choice between studying uh, crying babies and laughing babies, well, um, I knew which one I prefer. Sure. I'd, I'd imagine ethics committee approval might be more difficult as well. <laughs> yes. we poke the babies with sticks versus <laughs> tickling them and telling <laughs> funny stories. OK. Yeah. Um, so uh, why, why is it babies laugh so much is the next question. Yeah, good follow-on. So, um, yeah, one of the good uh, connections to looking at their laughter is that it's, you know, them discovering new things in the world. It's like, I never saw that before. That's amazing. And it, a lot of their laughter is the laughter of, of delight and discovery, you know, the, the little eureka moments in their world. Um, it's also so much of when we laugh is with with other people we laugh in company uh we laugh with our best friends and a lot of what babies are laughing at is not things but laughing with the people that they're sharing that moment with this is the ultimate in baby laughter and this is pure social connection you know can you see me can't you see me um so yeah they laugh more because they're discovering more and because they have just really awesome friends. Yeah, absolutely. Um, speaking of philosophy and the meaning of life, do you think humans have free will? Oh my goodness! And if they don't, if, if they don't, do you think the question of life is still relevant? Well, there's a curveball. Thank you, Igor. <laughs> that is a great question. Um, yeah, so I, I, um, uh, I think there it doesn't seem to be a a really good answer to the question of free will um, in science. A lot, lot of scientists um, uh, are either, you know, they try and uh, negotiate away the question and say, yes, oh, if you know enough about the brain, there will not be any free will or there will, there will be. Um, and I, I haven't yet seen anything that sort of is a, uh, it's going to give you a sort of answer that makes you feel like um, the mystery clears up in any way. It's going to remain a mystery for us all. Um, the the one way that you're supposed to be able to cure the mystery is by um, meditating really intensely for 20 years. And part of what goes away is this illusion of the self. Um, that's part of one of the goals of uh, um, extended meditation. Um, and at that point, they would say, yes, the, the, um, what's missing is uh, is perhaps the self. So this idea of your, yourself rather than a free will, whether what that looks like, what that feels like, I've absolutely no idea. So, again, that's not much use from the outside. Um, but, yeah, I, so, uh, <laughs> um yeah, maybe the skeptics will have a good somebody who can answer that question in in future weeks. That's a, uh, we can discuss that in the Zoom <laughs> probably later on today. Yeah, twenty years of meditation seems like a lot of work to go to for a potentially unsatisfactory answer. 
I, I, I just just pop some pills and go to Glastonbury instead. <laughs> okay. Right. Um, an anonymous question again. What are your observations and takeaways from neuro, neuro atypical or babies with neurodevelopmental disorders, if you've worked with any? Yeah, I haven't worked directly with um, any babies with uh, neurodevelopmental disorders. My my old lab um, at Birkbeck Baby Lab, um, they do a lot of research uh, on that topic. And I think um, the the important message about uh, atypical development is that it's a different pathway. So it's not a, a set of things that get set in stone at the beginning of your life and then that determines everything that comes afterwards it really is you start from a different place and you find a, new, a different niche and that if the world um was more uh accepting and sort of made space for that niche there would be a lot less stress for someone who was neuro, less neurotypical um and um one interesting example there is the finnish school system where um the, in any given class, uh, all the children in that local area go to that class, whether they've got any neurodevelopmental disorders or not. And so that, that a neurodevelopmental disorder is just part of the, the, the divergence of, um, you know, different types. I mean, nobody is normal. Everybody is, you know, um, abnormal in some way, shape or form. Um, and, you know, having a more sophisticated awareness of that would be good for society um but it yeah it takes it takes a bit more effort than where we are at the moment okay i uh, may uh, is there difficulty maybe finding finding sort of babies like that to study i mean let, let me open this up a little bit how do you find your subject matters to study this the concept of mm -hmm. a baby lab does sound a bit sinister right so do you are you wandering yeah. about outside just looking for women with prams and uh, or how do you recruit? In in, in a way, yeah. In it, um, so one thing you'll find is a lot of mothers who are at home with their babies don't have a lot of things to do, and so they and they have this little miracle in their in their arms who's doing some new and wonderful every day, and we're the scientists saying, yeah, we believe your baby is a miracle, and we're we're actually interested in what they could do today that they couldn't do yesterday. So once we've got a few mums who've come into our lab and taken part in a like some sort of study, they usually tell their friends that it was a good fun day out for them and the baby um, to come and see these scientists who were completely fawning over um, over the baby. Okay. Much more fun than the lab next door where they make all the babies <laughs> cry and stuff, right? Okay. Um, yeah, especially another, my lab, yeah. yeah. Yeah, your lab's the best, I'm sure. <laughs> okay, next question from the sceptical Gumby again. Do babies knock things off surfaces because they're learning? Or is it because they're like cats and they're knocking them off just because they can? <laughs> well, so yeah, from that video, I think it was definitely a bit of both. Um and yeah, one of the earliest things that babies are experimenting with is lots of um, physics. So there's, it's not just knocking things off, but there's lots of uh, uh, yeah, banging things on on things, yeah, putting things in their mouth, and um, a lot of that is to just right, what what will happen, what's going on, but then as soon as there's a yeah, the adult there, you could see that. This is now not about the thing itself. It's, an, it's a sophisticated experiment I'm performing on this person as to, to seeing what's the limit of their patience and, uh, you know, what, why are they responding in the way they're responding? Um, because the biggest challenge, you know, to understanding the world is not things, it's other people. You know, the other people are the biggest mystery in the world. Yeah, for sure. I mean, my, my two-year-old, I mean, go, rewind a year, it was definitely a physics experiment. Right now, it's more, you know, let's social, let's um, see, social yeah, <laughs> let, let's try and push some boundaries with mum and dad, you know, and that that's that's fun in itself, you know, depending yeah. on how, how good a day I've had. Uh, okay, next one is from Paul. Uh, how different do you think the answers would have been if the question had been framed more around purpose than meaning? I guess we're talking about life here. Yeah. Um, 
I mean, so it would have it would have spoiled the whole uh, Douglas Adams connection in my in my original um, uh, letter. Um, and I think that's kind of what the philosophers who said, you know, it's not real thing to say meaning, but it's OK to say purpose, um, do make that distinction. Um, you know, that's the sort of philosophical nitpicking that <laughs> makes me dislike philosophers. Uh, <laughs> because I don't really see much. You know what I was getting at. Um, so hopefully it shouldn't have made too much of a difference. Um, but the difference that it does mean make is is beyond my pay grade. It's philosophy, not not psychology. Yeah, there's, there's, there's definitely a change in tone when you when you use the word purpose. It's, it seems like there's there, there's a goal or a target to meet, whereas meaning's a little bit more reform i think in in, in its interpretation but hey yeah it's yeah. way above my pay grade anyway. <laughs> okay but you know talking you know since you just said um you know your disdain for philosophers igor throws in yet another <laughs> beautiful little curveball did learning philosophy make you more or less happy um so yeah i um i i never learned philosophy at, at um, at college or anything and l getting these responses from philosophers it did make me happy every single one I got and, and even the, the response from the economist it, it was um, yeah it, it's nice to know that there were there were 644 people whose job it is just to sit around um, and yeah to question why there are even questions and some of those answers like the um, Derek Parfit, why the universe, why anything um, to, to ask those questions um, is great. Sometimes they're not very good at then explaining that in language that we can understand. Um, sometimes they are. Um, and I think it's fine you know, that they're um, a lot of the time they are just talking to other philosophers. Um, so it's, yeah, I'm glad they found their purpose, perhaps. <laughs> okay, perfect. I wouldn't want to be one, though. Uh, okay, uh, another anonymous question. Finding meaning is thought as a gain, but it can be detrimental. Say if having meaning is counterproductive, if it disappoints, should we carry on looking? Ooh. Um, and I think that's, that's uh, a question everyone can ask themselves. I think, um, you know, I certainly feel like it's worth getting a bit closer to whatever the truth might be. I would hope that that's kind of the philosophy of a lot of skeptics as well, that, um, you know, ignorance might be bliss, but it's not the kind of bliss that I really want. I think that's fair. Um Many folks seem to be way too busy kind of living their life to figure out what the meaning of it is anyway, right? Mm. Okay, uh, Vic says, what do you think education should do with a child's tendency to see the world teleologically? Uh -huh. Yeah, so it's a very good question. So the, um, what do ed education should do with a child's tendency to, to see the world as to sort of means and ends, to sort of everything that is going towards a goal? It's what teleological is about. And um, I think that that's the problem, one of the big problems with education, that education sets up the expectation that everything is teleological, you know, because from age three onwards, you're being made to do standardized tests and you're being taught towards the test. And what would be great is if education was able to be a bit less anal about all these things and a bit more um, uh, open-ended, uh, not expecting that uh, uh, the goal of going to school should be to achieve uh, these three standards. Um, I, I think I, I can't remember where I've seen it, but it, it said that it's actually more stressful being a child in, in certain Far, East, far Asian uh, countries, East Asian countries, than it is being an adult because of the pressure that's put on them at school it's just completely stressful and that's all about where things lead um yeah you know, one if you're a, a real cynical realist about the world like that's absolutely necessary given the state of the world 
I would like to turn it around and feel like, no, if you if your schools create that message, then you're you're setting up that mess. And if you turn it around and made your schools more um, giving children autonomy, giving them the trust in their own goals and own directions, um, that it would be better for society as a whole. So very good question. Yeah, I mean, school, I remember, goes on for quite a long time. Surely there's a there's some there's some wiggle room in there for, you know, practicality versus, you know, open free thinking, right? Yeah, and I think there's, you know, by the end of school, you should have achieved certain things, but you, you know, you can't prescribe that as something that everybody should do and everybody should do perfectly to this level. And it's like one of the things that as soon as you start measuring something, the measure beca itself becomes corrupted because everybody now focuses on the measure rather than why you were measuring things in the first place. And schools are, you know, a current example of that uh, writ large, that that's, you know, we're missing the point of what education should be um, you know, providing people with skills um, to solve their own problems rather than to fit into little boxes. Oh, for sure, yeah. And I've heard some some fun horror stories of uh, you know sc school headmasters, you know, sort of trying to trying to kick out the unruly kids as much as possible yeah, to, to uh, help to sort ridiculous. of raise their uh, raise, uh. raise their average grade levels and such like. Okay. Let's go on to the next question, which is purely just to make me look like an idiot because I can't. What do you I've, think about the icky guy? Icky guy. I mean, I've been described as an icky I'm glad guy you, on many I'm, occasions. I'm glad. I'm glad you try to pronounce the icky guy. I don't. I don't know. Um, I mean, so that is this one, isn't it? Of having the combination of a purpose, um, a goal, a passion, and something else, and um that sort of does overlap quite a lot with the um, Michal flow concept um but it's um it, just like we were saying about schools like if you sort of set that up as your uh you must get a guy um then you've missed the point if you're lucky enough to have all of these things come together um you may be happier as a result, but don't let the tail wag the dog in, in those sorts of things. Um, start from, uh, well, why am I enjoying things? Rather than, if I just do these things, I will then end up enjoying them. Uh, okay. Well, I'm glad you knew what the icky guy concept <laughs> was. That could have been embarrassing for both of us rather than just me. Uh, okay, next question um, from Anonymous again. By the way, Anonymous means too lazy <laughs> to write your name in most right. cases, right? So it's not just one Anonymous. Yeah. No, 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 no. It's, it's many, many yeah, lazy yeah. people who can't or don't want to type their name. Okay, so question is nature or nurture? I like to think 99% nurture. Your talk seems to confirm this somewhat. Uh, so it it's always a bit of both um in the sort of the academic battles i'm sort of uh, there's a whole group of baby scientists who say oh nurture is the really important thing and there's another group uh who say no na nature lots of things are built in um even with babies they're a bit like giraffes they have lots of things they learn from scratch I i'm definitely the other extreme but i also think if you stop and think about but what can you change? You can't change what's provided by the genes. You That's already set down. Um, and there is an awful lot you can change once you um, create a stimulating environment and um, provide the right support. Um, so if we're focusing on what is, um, you know, what can be done, what, you know, starting from where we are, you work with what you've got, and then that's, um a hundred percent about nurture mm -hmm. i mean my niece and nephew are twins you know so nurture is essentially identical but very very different personalities very different response to stimuli and that sort of thing so 
you know, there's there's got to be a there's got to be a genetic element in there somewhere. Maybe so. Maybe it's not quite ninety nine percent nurture, though, right? Um, well, so no. So, and I guess a lot of nurture is what what you choose to do yourself. So, um, David Beckham becoming a great footballer was David Beckham choosing to spend a lot of time playing football, and so he's nurturing his own talent in that respect. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, and then, yeah, as you say, they're a, a niece and nephew, so they were, they're fraternal twins, are they? Correct. Yeah. Yes. Um, so they're only going to be as related as a brother and sister. So they're not mm. going to have, uh, um, so they're going to, yeah, they're going to have quite a different genetic starting point. Yeah. And then one of them's got a brother, the other's got a sister. So they've got a different environment as well. Tishy. All right. Um, next question. What age do babies go from happy, mindful, successful human beings <laughs> ground down by the weight of life? Ah, oh, cheery stuff there. Yeah, brilliant question. That you you were paying attention, uh, and I'd say it's something to do with school that's to blame for that. As we, um, we're um, probably currently, you know, a lot a lot of the the place that happens is um with the need to to succeed on a very narrow set of metrics that are provided by schools and government sadly and yeah it would be nice to see it done differently the playground can be pretty unforgiving at times as well as the actual class time right yeah, yeah. okay we're winding our way towards the end. Just a couple more here for you, Casper. Um, firstly, who is Ruby? We need Ruby. to know. Yes, I left that up there. So Ruby's my best friend. She lives at the other end. I live in Brixton. She lives in Walthamstow. Um, so uh, if she's ever in Brixton, she's never going to go home. She stays here. Um, so we are off of the sequence of people who stayed in my spare room, uh, it's now currently Ruby's room. Oh, nice. <laughs> Excellent. Um, okay, and the last question, and but definitely not least, where did you get your T-shirt? Uh, Please tell me it was Glastonbury. <laughs> TK Maxx, actually. <laughs> what an incredibly unsatisfactory answer. I know, what a way to end. <laughs> we we would have accepted a lie there. Um, but, Casper, we've taken so much of your time. Um, so thank you so much for joining us this evening. We really well, do thanks. appreciate it. It's been great fun. So, folks, please, in the Twitch chat, give us some virtual love for our speaker this evening. And could you also extend that love to our tech team for tonight, which is Matty and Malcolm, and uh, the backup MC for tonight, the wind beneath my wings, the lovely cat. Um, Very much appreciated. So, reminder, folks, we are heading off to uh, our Zoom pub, the Lockins Razor, um, after we close the session off here. Feel free to join us in there. Even if you don't want to chat, you can just join and listen. You don't even need to put your camera on. Just come in and drink in the lovely banter. Uh, Otherwise, remember, please support us as best as you can. Giving us money is great, but anything you can do just to kind of spread the word, help people find out about us, say nice things about us, write fan fiction about us, send carrier pigeons to people about us. That would be nice, anything you can. Remember, next week we're back with Dr. Lindsay Osterman. 7 p.m. Uh, here at twitch.tv slash SITV. So thanks again, folks. See you on the other side. Eggman out. <laughs>